Yeah, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. The legendino Tim Vickery is in city, in sunny Rio after your sojourn uh, in Europe, Tim. Yeah? yeah, and holidays. Oh, right. You know, it could be the future. I've, it was the first time I went somewhere new for like a holiday in, wait for it, 29 years. Uh, and uh, I, I loved it. It's obviously done horrible things to my mind. It's messed up my mind. Uh, and it's led me to the conclusion that, uh, Dutton, you are looking a little bit like a kind of buffalo soldier, dreadlock rasta in your in in in, in your in your in your in your dreadlocks and your cheap blue top. Yeah, I, I was trying to look more like a Elvis Presley, you know, that kind of uh, era of musician. But you're absolutely right. It's cheap. It's horrible. But I thought <laughs> I'd wear it. It was either there or be topless. So I decided to go for the cheap. Look. It's, it's almost the right colour for today. Isn't it? Hey, blue moon, <laughs> you see me standing around. And we've got someone with us today who can provide a ding a ding a ding ding a ding a ding a ding a ding a ding 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 but they're doing a live version of Blue Moon. And it's no disrespect to anybody uh, that's a Manchester City fans, but they go, Blue Moon. <laughs> I said no disrespect, so don't take it in a bad way. I heard it. I heard it. You heard it. You heard it. And of course, you win everything nowadays. So you're on a Blue Moon, I suppose, constantly. Well, I suppose so. Things are different, that's for sure. But um, we, we're going to talk about times when um, that was not the case. Yeah, I, I went to the old main road ground. Um, it was a fantastic. Did you enjoy there. yourself there? Um, I did actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was much better than going to Old Trafford. Let me say that for <laughs> one. And I'm not sure if the new Etihad Stadium can recreate the, the somewhat. It's not anarchy, but there was something emotional and unregulated authentic main, main road yeah, yeah. no i think it's, anarchy is probably a pretty good word well i, I choose my words very very carefully so it was a great place look, a great place it's fantastic yeah. and the, the whole neighborhood's changed as you know it has yeah. are, are there simon are there city fans who despite everything that you're being served up with today are there city fans who are nostalgic for the past absolutely lots of them <laughs> and I'm one of them. Um, we're a contrary bunch, Tim. So yeah. uh, you'd think, well, you, you'll be rolling all over this. This is just fantastic. It's the best of times. But um, if if you've grown up with City through the 70s and 80s, 90s even, um, then you've really only been party to desperate things moments of possible glory being snatched away. It's a club, as you know, that has the, the finest and most profound history of mucking things up, even when it didn't look possible to muck it up. Hmm. Um, that's that's the whole way that the, the place was put together. You know, we're talking about Main Road and it being a little bit anarchic. The, the match day experience there was a bit anarchic. Um, even the, the way the place was put together was ramshackle none of the stands matched um it was a strange old place but it was an authentic 70s football experience um and city were fit for that kind of a, a stage i think you know they're now a team that is completely different and and fit for the the modern theater that they play in but it's a different world and um the youngsters love it of course and and those oldies love it a little bit but try not to love it too much because those you, hard times do you feel were great. that it's not your world it's someone else's bit. world. a little bit i mean obviously things have gone into the stratosphere as far as winning things are concerned and now being part of the european elite so yes it, it isn't my generation of cities fans world at all not at all are you we have a little the... peep in from time to time and we, we yeah. visit these majestic European venues to see City trotting out. I, I still have to pinch myself when I'm sat in the in Bernabeu or the, the, uh, wherever it is, uh, Allianz Arena or, or New Camp, and, and that's City trotting out. You know, I think this is amazing. I'll never get used to that. You're, you're, you're taking us 
back today mm-hmm. to we're going to uh, March the 20th 1979 yeah. uh, and uh, it, it's City in the, in the quarterfinals of the old UEFA Cup yeah. against Borussia Mönchengladbach mm-hmm. and the whole look and the whole aesthetic of the thing you couldn't get more late 70s if you tried could you perfect you know, the, the 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 rutted pitch in germany you know the the, the hairstyles I was taking the littered the littered yes. pitch in germany <laughs> why have you chosen why have you chosen to take us back to to, the, to this dawn of time well this was this was the heyday of of city as they were i think um and it it's a sort of pivotal game as far as the book is concerned which is a history of city in europe because ridiculously, um, for those youngsters that that um, are now following the cause, they, they will think, yes, this is brilliant. And has it always been like this? Um, and was there any, anything ever that went before? And for a lot of people, I think, well, no, you know, European competition is new for City. They're they're plastic nouveau riche, but they're not, of course. You you know damn well they were they were yeah. going going at it hard and fast in the in the sixties and seventies. One of the inaugural uh, European winners from our uh, bejeweled shores uh, right back in 1970. So, you know, they'd been there and done it. Uh, the book was about the, the journey back to try and do it again, which hasn't occurred yet. But uh, that Borussia game, especially the way game in Munch and Gladbach, um, last ever European game to be played in that stadium uh, and we didn't leave that stadium for another uh, 20 years Um, and the away game was the last City European game until 2003 so 1979 to 2003 complete absence from the fields of Europe it's quite extraordinary really now City are are Britain's most um, expected uh, Champions League participants they're the ones with the longest consecutive run in the tournament without missing a season this is unthinkable stuff if we go back to this moment in time in 1979 they still haven't won it champions league they still haven't won it still haven't won it absolutely so and when you talk of being in a european elite can you really talk about that without having won the well this is one of the big questions Dutton, isn't it um uh, can we consider them elite participants i think we can but it's a it's a fair question they've not won it but they are previous european winners so they they're not exactly european royalty as, as some other fans like to call their teams but you know they, they've been around the block a few times i think winning the champions league would um put a full stop to it and then people would have less of an argument about it i think um but as far as uh, time of the season each year they are invariably included um so for me that's that's already pointing in that direction but um actually uh, pulling it off would um would be uh, would be nice finally that, that elite group so just one more point Tim, mm. very quickly that elite group that you talk of in europe they Distinguish themselves from the rest of the pack. They on how much money they've got behind them. Well, it isn't like that. Uh, unfortunately, the get it, this kind of money flowing in is Newcastle. It will take them a while before they're even competing at a, a lower European level, I would expect. So it, it takes massive investment, luck, planning, strategy, and plenty of time. Um, people seem to miss one factor uh, in this, that City are extremely well run. So, you know, the, there are lots of things that go together to pushing a team into this or close to this, this group, because the, the other members of the group, let's face it, they've been there a long, long time. And it's nice to see new members of an elite. I'd prefer there wasn't an elite at all, to be honest, but um, that's the way it is. If an outsider does manage to come in, and there's always a chance because football is football, mm. they can only come in for one year, yeah. can't they? Yeah. Because after then they get they all the best to... players picked off, don't they? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it, it is a closed shop. 
Mm. Um, but I, I'm, if you'll forgive me a little bit of guesswork, I'm going to imagine that you climbed on, on board the bus uh, late 60s, early 70s, when everything was very, very different. But City were a go-ahead, powerful club. Yeah. at that time weren't they yes they were they were and the again going back to the munch and gladback game that i've i've picked out um that was interesting and in that it was the very game where malcolm allison came back into the fray because he had been responsible with joe mercer for the earlier uh, glory including the european glory in the cup winners cup final 1970 in vienna he was the coach, Joe Mercer was the manager, and the pair of them hauled City out of the second division and made them league champions within two seasons, made them League Cup winners, FA Cup winners, uh, Community Shield winners, and winners in Europe. Uh, and it began to go sour, as these things tend to do, um, and that broke up in the in the early to, to mid-70s. But by the late 70s, the City chairman, Peter Swales, was getting itchy feet. He'd been trying his best to to chase down United and to make City top dogs in Manchester for a long time. And he thought the the, the missing ingredient was bringing Big Mal back. Um, so Malcolm Allison came back, and we'll talk about that, I'm, I'm sure, in a little bit more detail in, in respect of this particular game, because there's quite a lot of chemistry going on there. But Malcolm Allison was, was uh, in many ways, similar to, to today's coach, Pep Guardiola, in that he was a deep thinker about football, um, an innovator, and occasionally prone to slightly strange big match tactical decisions, which again we'll see in this game. He fascinates a, me, Big Mal. Uh, yeah, it absolutely yeah. fascinates me. Yeah. It, it is almost bizarre that such a London figure, <laughs> if you look at his career, it, it's so associated with with Man City. You know, for, yes. for both good and bad. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in your take on him. Because I find him such a frustrating figure. He was yes. such a, 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 a little bit the same with Venables as well, who's from mm. the, the same ilk. They go, yes. and Venables does more, but they both could have been so much more than they were. And the distractions in both cases were different. Yes. In, well, I, I like a Maverick, and I think City fans of, of my era love a Maverick as well. We had Mavericks on the pitch, and we had a Maverick trainer too. Yeah. Um, you're right, he was a real London figure. Uh, and he just he was one of the many that came north and took took to life in the north, you know, and, yeah. and northerners took to him um, and the chemistry just worked. It was fabulous. He's a, he's a great hero of mine, perhaps because he was flawed. Uh, yeah. We all like a flawed genius, don't we? Um, and he was really, really good at, at what he did. But he had a side to him that was self-destructive, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, he. He later do, became do an alcoholic, the, unfortunately. So do you he think was the media really... celebrity thing that he cultivated was the thing that that brought him down. Well, that began to split his personality, if you like, because uh, the the guy we saw on TV with the loud shirts uh, and the loud opinions wasn't really the football manager, Malcolm yeah. Allison. You know, it was, he, a, he, it was a caricature. Yes. It was really. I think he put and you, this you on. you become a prisoner of your own personality that you create. I guess so. You? I guess so, yeah. So this, again, fascinating aspect of, of the person who was Malcolm Allison. If he could have concentrated on the football, he was peerless. Yeah. You know, there was just really no stopping him. Well, people uh, forget that even after his, he comes back to City mm. and it doesn't go right, even after that, he wins the double in Portugal he not did. with Benfica, no, not with, with Porto, but with, with Sporting, Sporting Lisbon. Yeah. It's an incredible yeah. achievement. You yeah. know, he's he's. Uh, I, I hadn't realised that he was already back for this game. Yes, which makes it even more fascinating. Yes, from indeed. the point of view of the bench, because you know, on the the, the Borussia Mönchengladbach bench, you have Udo Latek, yes. famous coach, mm. and who is his assistant? Jupp Heinkies. Yes, who'd been a great player for the club. Yes, and is just about to launch an extraordinarily successful coaching career. Yeah. And one of the things w watching this game uh, is it surprised me, actually, just how fluid the game is, mm. despite the dreadful pitch. Yes. And you're seeing neither side really operating with a centre forward. You're seeing so much fluidity. It, from a tactical point of view, it's much more of a of a of a modern game than I'd actually expected. Absolutely. Well, we've got the two coaches to thank for that. Heinkers, by the way, as a footnote, would would also touch base and be successful in in Lisbon as Allison 
uh, was with Sporting. Hank has uh, had a, a moment with Benfica, of course. So there are lots of coincidences. And, a, and lots Guardiola of, as well. He precedes yeah, Guardiola. Yeah. So, so uh, lots of coincidences, lots of crossovers, lots of um, lots of interesting points to talk about. Uh, but you're right that that was also a, a very interesting game or pair of games for that reason. There was lots of talk in the press before the games about tactical innovation, what Malcolm Allison thought he was going to do to surprise the Germans, because Munch and Gladbach. They were the big guys from Germany at that stage. Yeah. They they'd won several league titles in the seventies in uh, been in, in the, the European Bundesliga. Cup final two years earlier. European Liverpool. Cup final against Liverpool, UEFA Cup final against Liverpool a few years before that as well. So they were no mugs at all, um, and they had an excellent side packed with with international quality. And Allison decided um, he would tinker. And he would do a bit of uh, tacti tactical skullduggery, if you like, to see if he could get the better of uh, Lattic and Hankers. So uh, he put Mike Channon on the wing, which was not his place. You know, he was a, an inside forward, if you like, um, sometimes a centre forward. He had Barnes out on the other side. So he wanted to, to broaden the game out. Yeah. And and see if he could um, get in behind the Germans. You know, there's all it sorts really of interesting. interesting. It's, like, it's like a four-four-two without without strikers, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah. it's really interesting. Funny, you know, without strikers, which um, what has what has Guardiola been doing with City for the last yeah. year and a half? Yeah. You know, it's 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 amazing, really. Um, but it didn't stop there. Uh, he he put Willie Donachie, who was a very steady, extremely left-footed left back. Scotland yeah. international. He'd just come back from the, the 78 World Cup in Argentina, uh, fully decorated, uh, hugely experienced left back, played him at right back. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know Willie Donachie had a right foot at that point, but he, he decided to put him on, on the right side. Incredible. And then, of course, there was Nicky Reed. Uh, he gave Nicky Reed his debut, mark marking Alan Siemenson, the European Footballer of the Year. This is an 18 year old kid that he plucked out of the junior ranks. He, he loved his enthusiasm, yes, didn't he? Big yeah. man. He said, This is going to be the new Dave Mackay. Um, at that point, everybody knew he was going to play him. You know, actually, you realize who he had in reserve, who should have been playing Casimir's Dana and Colin Bell. I mean, can you yeah. imagine dropping yeah, Bell and Dana and putting uh, Nicky Reed in? Bell had gone, really, hadn't he? He, he had, tried but he hard. That European um, run, the UEFA, <laughs> UEFA Cup run in, in that season, those were the only games Bell played because Tony Book, who was the manager up to the Mönchengladbach game, he knew damn well that Bell's European experience, international experience, even on one leg, which practically yeah. that's what yeah. he was doing, the poor guy, um, was worth having. And Bell had been in every game, practically every game in that run, uh, but Big Mal came in and said, no, move aside. I'm putting in this 18-year-old for his full debut and he's going to be marking Siemenson. It's terrific. <laughs> well, he must have known yeah. that Siemenson was so terrible that he'd end up playing at Charlton Athletic. <laughs> exactly. Don't go there. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come to that if we have to in a moment or two. But I should sort of reintroduce this uh, podcast, actually, because... Brazilian shirt name podcast, we always look at an iconic game from somewhere in the history of football. And today we're looking at the game quarterfinal of the UEFA Cup, uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach versus Manchester City. It's a game of two legs, as you state in your book, City in Europe, Simon. Um, game of two legs, of course. First leg is at the at main road. That ends one all, doesn't it? It does. So they go Who scores into... first? Um, Borussia scored. No, Channon scored first. I think Borussia got an equaliser, if I remember rightly. So it's uh, one all. Thing, you know the thing that most worries me about Channon? Tell me. He but he's bald. How the, how the fuck can that happen? That, that, that really, honestly, it really worries me. Yeah, he's bald. Like he's been bald for years. But like, look at him. Full head of hair, magnificent head of hair. Uh, that, that gives me nightmares, actually, the fact that, that Channon's bald. Yeah, well, uh, all the 70s footballers that we remember, obviously, they were, they were pretty hirsute, weren't they? The, mm -hmm. this, this was the era of, of hair, if you like. Um, oh, even, so... even Peter Swales, you know, the chairman, had a comb over. <laughs> well, he had plenty of hair, but not much in the middle, but he had, he had to sweep it over from one side. <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> you, you mentioned Joe Mercer there as well. I mean, it sort of makes me a bit dizzy to hear names like Malcolm Ellison and Joe Mercer in the same breath. Uh, you forget how they're a good, they're a good partnership, weren't they? Well, for they a juxtaposed, while. weren't they? Because yeah. Malcolm Ellison had the big fedora hat and, you know, big sort of overcoat, sort of Afghan type overcoat or whatever it was. And uh, oh, I he, wish he hadn't done all of that. I really wish he had. <laughs> well, you done. say that, Tim, but for for my generation, certainly, just seeing him on the bench made the game more appealing because yeah, he looked like yeah, you know yeah. the guy that you looked up to in your neighbourhood. You, you imagine like Pep that. Guardiola coming out instead of being dressed uh, head to toe in Stone Island, having a trilby and and uh, that would a, be very cool. a great coat yeah, or something or a sheepskin very, coat would be marvelous cool. wouldn't it yes. but yeah you're right it played to the audience to a certain extent but yeah. what you said about Shannon being uh, on the wing there Munchen Gladbach would have known that wouldn't they because between that first leg and the second leg back at Munchen Gladbach they had come over and watched Manchester City playing in what was then the first division yeah yeah um whether they did the same thing in between was another matter, of course. Um, against Bolton, didn't they do that against Bolton? Yes, if if I remember rightly, Bolton was the only game because that was a terrible winter and um, mm. there were lots of postponements. So uh, that sort of played against City in a way because they... I they remember it well. I remember doing my paper round of oh, the yes? morning. Yes. A bit chilly. Oh, yes. It certainly was, yeah. Obviously, this is in the South, so, you know, we, we, we wasn't... Imagine what it was like at, at Main Road. We're still waiting for those papers to arrive, by the way, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, some of them, the heavy ones. I'm, I'm sorry. They had, they had you just dumped them. Yeah. <laughs> yes, did, yes, did. <laughs> yeah. So they go back to Munchen Gladbach then. And I, I, I mean, Tim talked about the fluidity of the match. What I saw was the chess match going on. It was still very much a tactical match, wasn't it, between the two? And I'm presuming, like you said earlier on, that's the coaches. That's what they wanted. Yeah. yeah. How did Malcolm Allison intend then to outwit his German counterpart? Well, he uh, always had something up his sleeve, did Big Mal, you know, a little bit like Guardiola in modern times, but, um, uh, and similar to Guardiola, it didn't come off on this occasion, you know. Um, he thought by uh, stretching them that uh, something could be done because they had some excellent, excellent players through the middle. Um, a guy called Kala Della Hai was uh, one of the top performers in the Bundesliga. Um, all sorts of uh, big names that had played for Germany as well. Bertie Vogt, um, you know, this this was a, a team used to winning, solid um, serial winners, basically. So I guess it, it makes sense to try something a little bit different. The, he wants the, to slip the, the midfield runners in behind him. I think that, yeah. that, that's part of the idea. Yeah. O well, open them up. Yeah. The, the, the surprise for me was, because I remember Peter Barnes as like, ball tied to his foot dribbling. Yeah. And he's using him in a different role. As, as a kind of striker in a 4-4-2, although, although, although going wide. Mm. Do you look back at, do, do you think he expected too much of Barnes? Well, Barnes was a brilliant, brilliant player on his day. Um, whether he could play uh, anything other than an extremely wide left winger and very yeah. occasionally a right winger, because, you know, again, this was this was Malcolm Allison. He had uh, Tewart and Barnes on the wings, usually, um, and he switched them from time to time. That worked a treat often. Barnes cutting in a little bit like Arian Robin would do uh, decades later. Uh, he, would, he would go jinking down the right-hand side and you knew he was coming inside, but could you do anything about it? That was another question, because you know, he had a very, very good uh, left foot on him. Um, he was an England international, Peter Barnes, so, you know, he, he was he's top quality. Um, the question is, always with, with trainers like uh, Alisson and like Guardiola, they're... They're fidgety, they're restless, they've got so many ideas, they want to try things out, uh, and they're, they're pushing the envelope all the time. And you think, yeah, well, are, are some of the players capable of doing what is running through their mind? You know, he's got Willie Donachie with his left foot playing at right back. He's got Nicky Reed, bless him, you just sit on Siemensen, no problem. Um, and I, th I think in the, in the return leg, he had Tony Henry as well, playing with, yeah. with the number nine shirt. Yeah. Uh, central midfielder, reserve central midfielder, all sorts of things going on. You think, well, Tony Henry, what's he doing out there? 
Because he he's Dana's sometimes, still on the bench, you know. He, he's the runner sometimes from midfield, Tony yeah, Henry. He's, yeah, he's the one he's, getting getting beyond the strikers. He's a decent, solid player. But, you know, that, that City squad at the time, you know, Brian Kidd, Asa Hartford, Dave Watson, it was full of really good players. But um, Mal came in, shook it up and decided... Um, I think he said just before the the Gladbach game, you know, things are going to be different. I've had a look at the reserves, had a look at the youth team, and there are five or six so it's sort of scare tactics that you would expect, I suppose. There are five or six young fellas coming through, and you lot, you know, you better be on your game, otherwise they'll be in, in your place. And he's 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 talking to Mike Channon and Brian Kidd. They're probably that's looking what, at him thinking. Mike Channon bold. Mike yeah, that's Channon where his hair much. began to fall out, yes, in fact. Yes. <laughs> It, whatever his strategy was, I don't think Winston Gladbach fell for it. I don't um, think they did, did they? No, and they scored first. Yeah, well, it's, scored an, it's an second. even game, isn't it? Until until the stroke of half time, of course. Yeah, and and it was a good goal, by the way. The first goal, arguably, the second goal was uh, equally good. Um, and then they scored third, and they were three nil three three nil up before uh, Manchester City were able to respond. Yeah. Uh, do you remember seeing the game live, or are you, have you seen it? It, it, it wasn't live um because in those it? days um you could count the the live games uh, per season on the uh, on the fingers of one hand um so no it wasn't live i can on remember the fingers of two fingers yes uh, exactly it was the cup final in england v scotland that was about yeah, it wasn't it? it um which was fine we knew no better these days yeah. you know if you if you can't catch your own team in live action um either in the ground or on TV somewhere, then something's badly wrong, of course. But in those days, uh, that's the way it was. So now I can remember trying desperately to get um, a proper uh, connection for the radio commentary, uh, would have been BBC Radio 2 at the time, mm. um, listening to the dulcet tones of uh, Alan Parry and um, uh, Brian Butler. Um, and it would have been going in and out because obviously coming all the way from West Germany, as it was in at the time, it's a bit of a dodgy connection. He had oh, that, that's part, that was part of the magic. Absolutely. Of it, it? That's it's like, grainy it's like the texture. on the vinyl. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of, course, yeah. of course, yeah. Um, I remember American Forces Network coming out of Germany and uh, the, the thrill of being able to get a reception uh, that was so many miles away in those days. Now it's standard, obviously, yeah. even if it's on the other side of the world. This, this is this is one of the themes of our conversation, isn't it? <laughs> Three but, old fogies talking well, about how, how everything now, is, is especially for a City fan, everything now is just on a tray. Yeah. Whereas, oh, yeah. uh, you know, our, our generation, you know, we, we had to fight for our pleasures. But look at well, that, Tim. We're still, as a City fan, reminiscing very, very happily about those days when everything was was really pretty rubbish you know it was the end of an era in many ways like yeah. you said you know uh, last european game for manchester city for the next 20 years end of the tony book era i suppose end as well of the mark allison experiment as well, he, he takes over he? he then well, and, yes yeah and, it, and uh, decides that steve daly is going to be the new colin bell yeah, uh, more of his enthusiasm. Steve McKenzie was one of his enthusiasms as well. Steve McKenzie, wasn't he? yes. There's another another blast from the past. In <laughs> incredible, really. Michael Robinson as well. Before he became quite good, he he arrived from Preston North End for a huge amount of money uh, in those days, seven hundred fifty thousand pounds. I think Peter Swales had, had brokered a deal with with the Preston chairman for four hundred thousand pounds, and he said. Um, it's all done, Mal. We've got Robinson, uh, as you asked. And Mal said, uh, right, well, I'll, I'll just have a little look at that. Went back and uh, managed, to, managed to up the fee to 750000 I'm not sure how he did it, but, you know, that was all, all part of the, the bluster. Um, and he was desperately poor for us, unfortunately. So <laughs> there were all sorts of names coming in to replace the household names that we've been yeah. talking about. You know, there was a super city side in the late 70s. They'd won the League Cup in 76 under Tony Book. Um, and they were they were set for big things. They were runners up behind that fabulous Liverpool side. They came fourth the season. Forest surprisingly won the league. So they were they were you know contenders uh, throughout that period. And Mal came in and just blitzed the whole thing. And you talk of that wonderful Liverpool side. Um, from reading your book, I see that Bob Paisley tried all he could to ensure that you pulled one over uh, Britain, Munch and Gladbach 
Hey, yes. Do you know what tips he gave to Man City about their opponents? Well, according to the Daily Daily Express of the time, Dotton, he he opened Liverpool's entire files on Borussia Mönchengladbach, which is uh, must have been quite quite a thing to view. I would have thought in those days. You know, we remember the old boot room at uh, at Anfield with them snuggled in there talking football all the time. Well, he had um, put together various notes on Gladbach because of the the uh, tight relationship the two clubs had had in the previous years and uh, apparently uh, allowed uh, Malcolm Allison a good read of it but it, uh, it didn't um, didn't seem to work and then there's this bizarre West Ham dynamic <laughs> at, at, at City isn't it just bizarre because the Allison thing fails so who's appointed John Bond, mm. you know, who, yeah. who's been with Alison at West Ham. Yeah. But what's bizarre about it is, you know, West Ham, it was such a, a London thing and mm. such an East London thing. Mm. Now, I think Jeff Hurst felt something a little bit of an outsider because he came from Essex. Yes. You know? <laughs> and John Bond is <laughs> the one thing that you must never be in football. He's a yokel. You know, with his ludicrous yokel accents. <laughs> and so obviously in the hierarchy <laughs> at West Ham, Alison was the king. He was the mm. god. He was the king maker. He was the yeah. man who made Bobby Moore. He was. Uh, so, you know, and Alison is glamorous, uh, made his life as a poker player for a while. You know, mm. he's you could, he's like a James Bond figure, you know, yes. Malcolm Alison. Dated um, some very fast women along the way as well. Indeed, indeed yeah. yeah. And he's replaced... <laughs> by this ludicrous Swede rustic, you know, John Bond, who ends up doing better than Alison did. It's just bizarre West Ham dynamic taken a few hours north. Yes, yeah, a little bit strange, isn't it? John Bond sort of tried to be the big time Charlie, but with that accent, it just wasn't yeah. going to happen, was it? Um, and he always, he, he, he's, he's a, bit, a bit of a sort of Spoonerism fan. He, he would yeah. come in and say exactly the wrong thing at the wrong moment. I remember there's, there was a fabulous... Um, documentary on Granada TV just called City exclamation mark. I don't know whether you've ever seen that. The most extraordinary. It's fly that on... year, isn't it? It's the Alison. It's that. It's the. It's I the, remember. It's the it. turnover Alison, from Alison to Bond. I remember Alison in the dressing room with no shirt on. Yes. Kind of rallying the troops. Yes. And, yes. And that must have frightened so the life out of them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but there's there's a team talk from Bond when he comes in. It's not even a team talk. It's a team gathering when he's been uh, confirmed as the the new manager at Main Road. So he gathers them in and he's sort of nonchalantly leaning against one of these terrible Formica sideboards that, that were inside Main Road at the time. And he says, well, there's no messing guys with this burr, this, um, this I don't know where he's from, but this terrible farmer's burr. Um, he says, now, now I'm in charge of Norwich City. And they all look at him and think, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> that's where you've just come from, man. You know, if, if this is your rousing welcome to the John Bond era speech, you know, that's not the way to start, really. But he did bring Mike Kevin with him, didn't he? Yes. There was lots of talk about Mike Kevin. Yes, yes. He wasn't a popular choice because, you know, why, why bring your son other than wanting to give him a job? Um, he actually turned out to be reasonable in, in a later reincarnation. But um, no, there was there was some resistance to that. I can remember on the terraces at the time. Um, he did bring in some very good players. You know, he, mm. he, City, again, were floundering at that point because Alisson had, had scuppered everything, unfortunately. And he brought in uh, Jerry Gow. Tommy Hutchison, Bobby McDonald yeah. in quick succession to try and right the ship because Alison was sacked with City bottom of the table. And, uh, and it worked a treat. It worked an absolute treat. Um, and Hutchison, McDonald and Gow in particular brought in Phil Boyer. Was he responsible Boyer. for Dave Bennett as well? Dave Bennett was already there. Um, he'd played under Alison. He'd played under Book as well. Um, but he was part of the, the Bond team that got to the Centenary Cup final. Um, and Bond shook it up. Of course, Bond and Alisson also met in the third round of the Cup that season as well, when it, Alisson brought his Crystal Palace team back to Main Road. Fantastic. The irony of it, you know, is absolutely but Was he, Was he still loved at City, even he then? He was. I can remember he came out onto the pitch, and uh, we were all on the Kipax, which was the terrace running down the far side of the pitch. City's ground was... Remarkable for many reasons, but also for that, that it was one of the few with the, the home end was actually on the side. Um, I can appreciate that one. Yeah, absolutely. 
the shelf. Why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah. No, it's uh, best. I think it's best. He it's, is. It's the best way to watch football. Absolutely. Um, anyhow, Allison comes out before the kickoff, and he'd done this many times as City manager. He used to before the Manchester derby, he used to come out at Old Trafford and run up to the packed Stretford end, waving four fingers, saying, we're going to hit four past you. You know, <laughs> what kind of a coach would do that these days? Absolutely brilliant showman. <laughs> yeah. So he came out on this occasion, having been sacked by City, and it was a muddy, grimy day, horrible pitch, and he had all the gear on as usual, big, long trench coach. I think he had the fedora on as well. And he comes trotting out, and he puts his arms out like that and starts running across the pitch towards the Kipax, and there's just this upswell of noise, a real spine-tingling moment from a showman, perhaps beginning the slide down to obscurity, but that was such a moment. The funny thing was, typical City, he got to the, the centre circle, complete ovation, waved a little bit, sort of soaked in, in, in a bit. He could see that he was slightly emotional about the, the welcome. And as he turned to trot back to the tunnel, the, the roar came up, Johnny Bond, Johnny Bond, Johnny <laughs> Bond. So the king is dead, long live the king, you know. Right. Fantastic moment. So you lot have got a sense of humour as well. We had to have in those days. <laughs> uh, but you still have to have today, don't you? I think so, yeah, I think so, because... Um, it's a different world, but uh, yes, I think it, it's important anyway, isn't it? You have to be able to have a laugh, and if you can have a laugh at yourself, that's even better, I think. And As a is... fan, when did you enjoy yourself most? <laughs> well, people sometimes ask me this, and I, I'm, I'm an obtuse so-and-so. I, I enjoyed, if I can narrow it down to a single season, the most fun I had following City was in season... 83-84. Second division? Second division. First season in the second division. Unthinkable for me as a City fan who joined the throng about 73. So I missed the glory period, but it was still the end of Dennis Law, the end of Francis Lee, Colin Bell. Um, so I saw a bit of that. I saw the glory of the 70s. I saw the downfall of Malcolm Allison. And I saw the, the slight upturn with John Bond. That also went badly wrong eventually, and then we got relegated. And imagining City in 1982-83 as a possible relegation candidate was just, it, it just was unthinkable. And even statistically, they were second in the table in November. Uh, and on the final day of that season, that was the first time we'd gone into the bottom three, losing to a uh, a, get, a goal from Raddy Antic of Luton at Main Road in that calamitous game, which was Luton needed to win to stay up. City needed just the point to stay up. So it was one or the other was going down and we held on till the 86th minute. Raddy Antic put a deflected shot into the North Stand goal and City were down. And we thought, well, this is the end of the world, you know, truly. It's a truly City way of getting relegated. And now what? And I got myself up, as did thousands of others, for the adventure to go to Cambridge and Carlisle and Cardiff and Notts County. And what a blast we had. Uh, good for you lot. Good for Fantastic you lot. Fantastic blast it was. That's how it's supposed to be, isn't it? That's Absolutely. Exactly yeah, it probably helps if you're winning most of the games as well, doesn't it? You know. <laughs> well, that first season that I'm talking about was the, the, the classic second division season from the 80s. There were three promotion spots available and Newcastle, Sheffield Wednesday, Chelsea and City started that season all in the second tier and in 1983 they were all giants um fallen giants and there were only three of those four going up of course city were the ones that missed out but it was a super season it was such an adventure um football was chaotic uh, following your team away from home in in, yeah. in those days was definitely chaotic you had to have your wits about you but um, something about it that was so unreconstructed and and uh, and real that it it really stuck with me. So what, when was your first trip into Europe? And your book is about City in Europe. Mm. When's the first time that you were able to to take your passport for a Man City game? Well, that wasn't until the the new era. So I I hadn't seen City uh, away from home in Europe until um, Schalke in the UEFA Cup. Um, in the in the new era, that would have been um, I'm not sure which year it was 2007, something like that, 2006. Um, work 
had taken me abroad by then. So I, I'd worked in, in Holland. I lived in near Amsterdam for nine years. Um, I'm now based in Lisbon. So in a way, my city supporting these days is easy, more easily done following them at away games in Europe than it is yeah. coming to Manchester every, mm -hmm. every other weekend, uh, which I can't do anyway. Um, so I started trying to get to as many away games in Europe as I could. So that's a sort of mini obsession within my city obsession that, that, um, that got me to this book in a way. Um, but it was also a story that I thought was worth telling. Is it first and foremost a book for city fans, long suffering city fans, old school, new school, that kind of thing? Well, a lot of the story is, is from the modern times. So there's a little bit in there for everybody, I would say. It's a, it's a fascinating story, I think. Whether I've told it properly or not, I, that's, that's up to the reader to decide. But I think it was a story worth telling. Um, there are so many, similar to the, the, the little quirks that we've been uncovering in the conversation so far, it's full of them. This, this is a, a strange thing about football in general, and City in particular. Lots of coincidences, lots of interesting little moments where you think, ah, oh, they've been there before, this mirrors something else, this manages exactly the same as that one, but there's 40 years between them. Lots of things that uh, I would call points of interest um, in a, a quirky story of a, a, a team that even in its present incarnation refuses to be absolutely spotless, absolutely faultless. They're still capable of falling on their nose, which is great, I think. I know someone... Well, uh... Uh, in Argentina, who is absolutely obsessed with Manchester City. Mm. And he's a river, he, he works in football. He's a River Plate fan first and foremost, mm. but he just loves Manchester City. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that it's your thing and you there's a little bit of resentment of this? Or do you think, come in, come in and share the suffering? Well, we, we have to say the, the latter, don't we? There, there always used to be a bit of a smirk on our faces when we looked at United and, and the place was full of tourists. Uh, same at Anfield, you know, always in those big games that the camera would close in on the, the throw-in taker and behind them is a load of people taking pictures and uh, you think, well, this is, this is not for us, but this is where City are now and it's becoming more and more like this, especially on the big European nights. Um, and football's for everybody, that's fine. Um, everybody can have an opinion about it. Um, that some of us go back a bit further and have experienced another kind of city is, is also fine. You know, there's, there's room for everybody, that's, that's fine. Yeah, this uh, game that we're looking at, 20th of March, 1979, uh, quarterfinal of the uh, Euro, uh, UEFA Cup, a very different city on the pitch to one that you'd see today, unrecognisable. Mm. if you like. Uh, this season for City is going to be very different from previous seasons, uh, all down to the fact that you finally got yourself a number nine, um, certainly to replace Sergio Aguero, if nothing mm. else, in Erling Haaland. What, what difference do you think he'll make, Haaland? Well, we got a focal point, um, as have Liverpool, strangely, you know, both, yeah. both changing to slightly... Um, totemic players really um literally um big uh, focal points as well we'll have to see how this um how this unfolds it's fascinating i think i think city have you know there's been lots of complaints and we're doing it without a striker blah 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 but you know it's been fine really um and with all those maneuverable players it doesn't really matter who's playing in the in the middle um or whether we've got anyone in the middle they they're coming flooding through from midfield they're piling down the wings that's great with Holland, I think it might have to become a little bit more structured, um, which could be interesting. I mean, Pep does structure, so that's fine. When you say structure, you mean more conventional, maybe? A little bit, yes. I mean, I, I'm not sure um, he can do the kind of things that Aguero did and the kind of things that uh, Jesus did. These were very manoeuvrable, very mobile players prepared to track back prepared to do the chasing down. Um, I'm not saying Holland won't do this, but um, he's definitely a different kind of player. He moves differently. He's a rangy guy, a, a, a solid guy, a tall guy. We'll have to see. Um, I'll be interested to see 
how this uh, how this all pans out. Um, after all the talk of needing uh, a striker, you know, it, it could well be that that's actually not the case. You know, if it, if it goes belly up, then they'll have been proved wrong. But if he starts scoring the kinds of uh, or the amounts of goals that he's he's scored in recent times for his country and for for Dortmund, then um, all will be well, I suppose. Well, let's look forward to it. The book is City in Europe. It's by uh, our guest, Simon Curtis, available now. Um, I don't know if you were told that we also look at the uh, musical soundtrack to the uh, the Times that we're talking mm. about, 1979, 20th of March. Mm. Uh, you Will Survive. Uh, that's mm. an anthem in itself, isn't it, for City <laughs> fans? It's at number one, the original by Gloria Gaynor. Not really? By- uh, do you remember that? Do you remember the I do, yes. And I've, I've heard it far too many times since then. Um, it's one of those songs that just uh, comes on when you don't want to hear it, isn't it? Now, 70s schlock yeah. is just everywhere, isn't Terrible. it? No, no, sweet no, Caroline. I cannot say yeah. 70s yeah. schlock about I Will Survive. No, 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 I can't no. say that. I mean, too late he thing, said it. Yeah. I know he said it, but I'm just <laughs> telling him. It's a, a parental <laughs> advisory always comes with this podcast. Uh, mm. and now it should be a ladies' advisory because you can't say that to any ladies that that is schlock. Uh, that is your proper, you know, torched, uh, torch anthem or whatever it's called, you know. Um, what about Oliver's Army at number two? Elvis Costello, much more. Well, that's time. much more like it, isn't it? Much I more thought like you'd it. say that. Yeah. How, old, how old were you at the time, Simon? 1979. God, a quick bit of arithmetic. I was uh, 15. 15, not bad, not bad. Mm. You were, so I was into age. my music, into my right music, that's, that's for sure. Uh, much more Elvis Costello than, uh, than Schlock, I have to say, than wow. disco, disco <laughs> stuff. If you have to say that, wait till you get to number three. Lucky right. number, Lena Lovic. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, I don't think that comes into either category, does it? <laughs> she, yeah, did, oh, what can you say? This is post-punk, this era. They're still yeah. trying to, like, get to grips with new wave, whatever yeah. that might be. There are still some people who feel that punk could become pop. Yeah. If they just found the right song, and I think this is one of them, Lena Lovitch. It was a mistake. The only, the only reason I remember and, and love Lena Lovitch, not for the music, although that song is is another one that that sticks in the mind somewhat. She always reminds me, for some reason, with word association thing with the um, the Czech football team. Is it Czech or, or Slovenian? I'm not sure where they're from. Uh, Litex Lovic. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Whenever they come on, I see their score. I, I'm mm-hmm. carried back to 1979. Yeah. To what think was of their lucky number? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> number one, that was hers. Presumably it was theirs yeah. as well. It was number one. But on a real tip, though, City do have, or City fans do have, music in their veins it is part of i mean uh, I, I, I joked at the beginning about uh, we joked at the beginning about blue moon sort of yeah. thing but uh, whether it's the oasis connection or whatever i'm sure it goes back much further than that but the hollies do... oh right of course That's i'm not sure be. if they were city fans but you know it's uh that was the sound of 60s manchester wasn't it for a while yes absolutely um 10 cc i think 10 CC. City fans as well yes. um and of course, the whole hacienda period yeah, um, yeah. is associated, in my mind, more with city fans than with the other lot up the uh, in the um, industrial estate. That yes, a- least- across the city border. <laughs> yes, well, um, I mean, um, I those know. territories past I Pomona. I think that's what you're exactly. referring to. I've lived in Manchester, so I know <laughs> there's only one team. In Manchester, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think United fans were were sort of concentrating more on the football in those days. You know, the Hacienda days and the uh, and the the nineties, which was an explosion of really, really brilliant music in the city. Um, because City was so abominable, you could switch and be into the into the music a bit more instead. You know, so there was a bit of both with the City fans, but there's definitely a, a strong connection with the with the music scene. You know. So um, which tunes from that era, the late era, would have, from this chart of the 18th of March 1979, would have fitted into the more sort of um, dance or the club scene of Manchester? Well, it, it's a really good time for, for disco records. It's There's brilliant. some fantastic it's disco brilliant. stuff. Yeah. It's just before, do you remember the, um, the whispers and the beat goes on? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Which was a game changer. 
It was yeah, a game changer because yeah. it started using all the sequ the, the sequences and all the, the electronic stuff. Yeah. A, a lot of the disco stuff here is instruments. Like on Chic, you know, um, mm. Players Association, turn the music up, which I always associate with summer. I was surprised to see, you know, because I always yeah. think if, if music could be mint choc chip ice cream, <laughs> it would be turn the music up by the Players Association. Mm -hmm. Gary's Gang. Uh, keep on dancing. I've got so many memories of that from the. What about Gene the, Chandler? Get down. Get down. Yeah, <laughs> Gene course, Chandler yeah. obviously did Duke of Earl. Your, your, of your course, thing you know why I'm on it. You know what? GQ I'm on it. <laughs> Disco Night, a fantastic record. But again, it's real instruments. It's just before village that huge te the technological Navy. change. Yeah, yeah. I was just mentioning village people in the Navy as well. Anyway, over to you, Simon. Yeah, but what, what, what? Which tunes? from this era would have made it onto the terraces of Main Road? Well, it's funny you should ask because um, there were some sort of crossover moments where it was slightly later, the early, early 80s, where the City fans would um, start up chants from uh, songs that were in the charts at the time. And it was a Casey and the Sunshine Band mm -hmm. uh, song where we were singing we were, instead of, um, I can't remember the words, but we were singing Cities Going Up instead of um, whatever the actual words were. Yeah, and there were yeah. there were three or four, Karma Chameleon as well. We, the, in the second division days, they were singing that with, with uh, suitable, uh, optimistic city tones mm -hmm. instead of the original uh, lyrics. So there was quite a crossover. Not all the songs were too cool, I have to say, but um, they they scanned well and they were they were easily remembered on the terraces. So they would do for us. Um, but I'm, I, so, I'm sure there's one from down south. Sorry, apologies. You, you carry on what you were going to say. Well, no, I was just going to say I'm I'm not sure what the rest of that um, list you have there looks like. But um, what what was in the top ten in there's, there's some good post punk oh, in Sound of the Suburbs, but are members which cool right, for yes. cats. Cool for, cool cats. for cats. Very nice. Very nice. From, 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 from Squeeze. I know, th this is so evocative for me. And I, I was coming up 14. And the month before, February 79, I started a band. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, I didn't have an instrument. That's okay. Couldn't play one anyway. <laughs> but, you know, and so, you know, you, that's where the paper round money is going. You know? <laughs> and so all through, the, all through this time. But it just seemed like a natural thing to do then. You know, to, to get together with some mates and 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 uh, and, and and get a band going, uh, Strange Town from the Jam. The Jam oh, are just about to brilliant. go whoosh. Yeah. yeah, that 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 year. It's 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 kind of it's kind of their year. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of glass Blondie, which is which is a fantastic. It's massive. Yeah, fantastic. Massive. But what about one of your boys from your ends, though, Simon? In the charts there, not his finest moment, I must say. <laughs> Nevertheless, surprisingly, he's in the charts. John Cooper Clark. Uh, All right. Cooper Clark. Play loud. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not brilliant. Um, so, but if it's you not hear him Beasley poet, Street, is it? It's not. Oh. Well, and he was the punk poet. He was the punk poet. He was, yes, but, he was. But I mean, it reminds me of the streets, you know, the young boy, I can't remember what his uh, name is, the streets, you know, original sounds, original pirate recording. <laughs> this is from the streets. It reminds me a little bit of that guy, Mike Skinner. Mike Skinner is his name, isn't it? The streets. Um, it reminds me a little bit of that. But um, I don't know, is he somebody that would have resonated? A little bit, yeah. I was certainly um, heavily into the jam. I thought they were fantastic. Um, that was a real sound of, the, of that period, wasn't it? Um, what was the song Tim mentioned? Was it That's Entertainment? Strange Town. Oh, Strange Town. So it's, it was earlier than that. That's Entertainment. Yeah, that was a classic song. Um, I, I was, like a lot of people, into many of those bands before they became hugely popular and then really dropped, dropped them like a sack of spuds after that because they just change as soon as they become widely popular. The, the as music soon as goes the record bit, companies get, get a grip on them. Yeah, yeah. the music goes a bit wishy-washy and it's, it's, uh, they start churning out um, what they think are going to be hits instead of really doing what they want to do. You know, But the jam in the early days were great and uh, um, I, I think you two were, were probably bubbling under a roundabout no, then as well. No, it's a li well. little bit too early for them. There are right. the, the skids into the valley. Is, Fantastic. Is, uh, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. They were brilliant. I, I, I always thought of the skids more as a kind of a post-punkers. But um, the, I'll tell you who else was brilliant, although Tim disagrees completely. Yeah, you're I obviously think, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is uh, a moment, a great moment for him. 
Bat out of hell by me. Oh, oh, please. God. Please. Oh, my goodness. You're the same as Tim. Simon, how can you be Lock. exactly the same as Tim? Lock. How can you be exactly there, there, there the is, same? I'm going to move this on as quickly oh, as possible. Otherwise, I'm getting gracious. embarrassed for you. Well, there is one respect, that, you know, respect to all taste. But really, yeah. that's, that's the talky United oh, of, of football, isn't yeah, it? Quite right. <laughs> there is one that really makes me think of you. And I don't know, Doc, and I don't know if you know it. Uh, it was... Um, the the and buzzards, darts. The, no, the, the, the Leighton Buzzards. Saturday night oh, beneath right. the plastic palm trees. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Check it out. Man. It's about finding heaven on the Seven Sisters Road. Yeah. And, th- yeah. th- and there's a little bit of a reggae touch to it, and it sights dancing to the guns of Navarone. Uh, and, well, uh, it, talking it, it's, of reggae... It, 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 have a listen to it afterwards. I'm to. sure you'll be reminded of your youth. And talking, talking of reggae, of, take talking it away. Of reggae, well, the great crown prince of reggae, uh, Dennis Emmanuel Brown, is in the charts with a classic that he did twice. And funnily enough, um, the version that he's, he's done here in 1979. Now, hang on, they went back. Okay, so basically, he did. He had this amazing song called Money in My Pocket. So number 15 in the charts. He initially recorded about 1975. And it was more kind of like a slow reggae. And then they speeded it up in 1977, got into the charts, got into the top 10, can't remember what number, in 1977, but they speeded it up. So instead of money in my pocket, but I just can't get no love. You know, they did it, money in my pocket, but I just can't get no love. And it got into the top 10. But here in 1979, they brought back the original version from 75, the slower version, which is a much, much more sultry song. But of course, it would be perfect for Man City nowadays, you know, money in my pocket, but I just can't get no love. I think I've got there in the end. That was what I was trying to say. Yes, you squeeze it in. Well done. <laughs> Listen, mate, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Me so, too. Absolute pleasure. And thank you very much for talking us through this uh, match, the last match, uh, for Man City in Europe for 20 years, 20th of March 1979, Bruce Hittman and Gladbach versus Man City. Simon's book is City in Europe, and as he says, it takes you right through their journey from 1970. Is it the, 60, the journey? 60, 68, 69. 68, just, 68. For, just for for people who are now, right at this moment typing it into their search engines, <laughs> how do you spell City? In like the title of, of, of the book. Is it E-H at the end or just yes. a, a, an That's everyday my question. Y? Yes. He's taking a piss. <laughs> Simon, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.